sharp four or Lydian E.
glad that you have joined us and are available for anything that you might need. We invite you to visit our website to see all of the events that are happening um, um, this week, both um, in person and online. Um, I would invite our ch um, children's ministry called Footprints, Helping Families Walk with Jesus, is doing a water and slime night Wednesday night at 6 in person. Um, someone asked me that earlier. Um, so if you have a kid in your life or just want to come get wet and slimy, come join us. Um, our um, Bishop Ken Carter is offering an online Bible study beginning Wednesday, September 9th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. If you would like to do Bible study with our bishop, uh, let me know and I will get you that information. The United Methodist Committee on Relief, also known as UMCOR, is already working in uh, Louisiana and Texas helping those impacted by Hurricane Laura. Um, if you would like to help, you can donate to UMCOR through our church's online giving site or by writing UMCOR on the memo line of your check. Um, our sermon today is provided by our district superintendent, Bob Bouchong. Bob is a graduate of Stetson, Florida State, Duke University, and Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, since 1981, he has served four local churches and is currently serving as our district superintendent. Um, he's been married to Jeannie for 46 years and is blessed with two children and four grandchildren. Uh, three weeks ago, um, Bob committed to preaching in person today. But on Thursday, he told us that he hadn't preached in public since March, and he thought he was ready, but decided to send a video sermon instead. So we will be watching the sermon online, um, and he has some comments for us then as well. Um, and since 1908, the United Methodist Children's Home has relied on our support to help children in crisis in Florida. And we have a video for you that spotlights their ministry. So if you would show that children's home video, now. So my name is Coda. I am 10 years old. Uh, I like to play sports. I like video games. Um, and I'm but nothing get into my head that doesn't need to be. He knows God in his own way and I see it um, in his interaction um, in him being respectful. So I'm hoping they get adopted. I'm looking forward to them letting me play Fortnite, um, let me play sports, and I hope they're nice people and they live in a mansion. We could not do what we do without you all's help. For everyone that supports the Children's Home, I want to say thank you for providing food for us, putting a roof over our heads, and not only for caring about one person, they care about all the other people. So if any of you want a 10-year-old boy and have a mansion, let me know. I'll hook you up. Um, they do rely on donations to keep their ministry open, and you can also give to the Children's Home through our website. Um, and, of course, you can always support the regular giving of our congregation. Um, we do have a lot of things that need funding. Um, but you didn't come to hear about money. You came to worship. So if you would join me in prayer. God, we are grateful for this opportunity to be in this place in this time. We are thankful that you are with us in all things. Guide our worship today. That it will be truly about you and not about us. And that we can leave here motivated and encouraged in our walk with you. Amen. Well, let's stand as we begin our time of worship this morning. The Lord has promised us that no matter what, here we go, okay, <laughs> his presence will be upon us if two or three or more are gathered in his name. So it is his, our prayer this morning that his spirit will fall upon us and he will open, his, open the heavens and pour out his presence to you. Yeah. 
praise to the everlasting God. Amen. You may be seated. Our children are dismissed for Children's Church. I know we have many concerns in the church, so if you have a concern, just lift it up to the Lord now as we all turn together for a time of prayer this morning. Merciful Heavenly Father, oh, how we love you. Your mighty hand is a constant comfort to each one of us. Your grace, your unconditional love for us is overwhelming. We thank you for walking with us during these tough times, for being with us when we feel alone, for being with us when we feel afraid, for being with us when the burden seems too heavy to bear. You never said that we would, have, we would not have troubles, but you have promised that your yoke is easy and your burden is light as you help us carry those things that are too heavy for us to shoulder by our own strength. You alone are our rock and our salvation. You alone deserve our praise and adoration. You alone can carry us through the darkness, through that dark night of the soul, Lord. Forgive us of our pride, of our unwillingness to acknowledge your presence in our lives. Forgive us for the fear we have when we know someone near needs to hear about you, yet we shy away from telling them of your love and forgiveness. Help us to see those around us that need you more than anything else in this world. Lord Jesus, walk with those that need your healing hand upon them today. We continue to remember Pastor Gary and his family, as well as the many others in our church family that are dealing with or recovering from physical ailments. Remind each one of us that you are the great healer and the great comforter. Thank you again, Jesus, for your sacrifice and for sending us your Holy Spirit to guide us. Teach us your ways as we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Shong. I'm the district superintendent here in the East Central District of the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. And I'm delighted to be here with you in worship this morning, sort of. <laughs> it really was my intention to be here with you in person. And what changed that is a decision that Jean, my wife, and I made just a couple of days ago to make a rather last minute trip to Delaware. We're gonna do a road trip up and back in a few days there. A total days gone, about five days, leaving this coming Thursday. And we just got to thinking about um, being with a group in person and then being in our son and daughter-in-law and grandson's home. And even though you're social distancing, you're wearing masks, you're doing all the right things, we were just a little nervous about that. So I, I apologize and I want to say how grateful I am to Janet and to Scott and to other staff members who um, pitched in at the last minute. Uh, Janet and Scott got a telephone call from me on Thursday morning uh, to inform them that I wanted to do it this way and they were both just tremendous. Rose to the occasion to do a video recording of the sermon. So I hope to be back another time when I can be with you in worship in person. Uh, I, I also want to say just a word about the cabinet appointment process that we will be engaging in. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased that we have covered uh, the next few months with preaching with several people, including your former youth director, Brian, who um, graciously has agreed to be the primary preacher during the fall. Uh, and then in, in January, um, we hope to appoint a permanent pastor here to follow Gary. I've met with your staff parish relations committee. I've met with your executive team. It's an impressive group of leaders, as I'm sure you know. And it was, it was really meaningful to me that the first concern on everybody's mind, including mine, when we met was Gary and what's going on with Gary and Mary Jo and their family and the heavy stuff that they're dealing with right now. And then secondly, a huge concern for First United Methodist Church in Mount Dora and the best leadership that we can find in consultation with the cabinet and with the local church and with the pastor that prayerfully we will identify. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about and having the honor to guide this process and working with the leadership team in this church as we uh, sense God's discernment in the next appointment of, for your new pastor. Again, thank you for having me this morning. So I wanna now um, invite you to turn your attention to this morning's scripture reading, which is Psalm 91. Hear now the word of God. The psalmist writes, you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at, at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. No evil shall before it befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver, says the Lord. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Grant that the words of my mouth, that the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts together in these moments together would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I wonder, do you ever have those times, those times where you can identify the source clearly or not? Do you have those times in your life that you describe as being in a funk? I know what that's like because periodically I have those times. Sometimes it's hard to, to function in the midst of those times. At the very least, it's, it's difficult to feel creative and energized and joyful. One day last week, I was in such a place when during my early morning quiet time, I, I felt myself drawn to the text that I chose for this morning. And I've decided that it, it's not an accident in this time of pandemic across the globe, in this time of, of grief and transition in the life of this church, it's not a coincidence that I was drawn to Psalm 91. I had someone who is, is dealing with some very difficult things in life come to see me one day. He would say that, that he's in a funk. He said he came to, to see me as a, a direct result of a particular sermon one Sunday morning when I talked about listening as a significant piece of what it means to be in prayer. Most of us tend to think of prayer as, as talking to God, don't we? Or we, we think of a prepared public prayer, such as when one of the ministers or, or a lay person prays in worship on Sunday morning, or, or maybe a, a prayer before a meal, or some other outward expression of talking to God. He wanted to hear about listening. A professor with whom I studied in the, the master social work program at Florida State University way back in the mid 70s would call down a, a student. In fact, one time she called me down because I described a conversation with someone else as talking to that other person. Whenever this person, this professor rather, would, would hear that phrase, she would say, oh, did you talk to that person or did you talk with that person? And the truth is, of course, that most of us talk primarily or maybe only to the other person. We're usually so intent on making sure that the other person with whom we are in conversation hears what we have to say that that's what we're thinking about as he or she is talking and we don't really listen very well. We miss a lot of what the other person says. And it strikes me that it's, it's really not so different as we communicate with God. We're so intent on sharing whatever it is that we want God to hear from us that we haven't learned to listen to what God has to say to us. Now, I've never heard God speak to me in an audible voice. I know people who have. I don't understand that, but I respect that. I believe that. I have come to believe in my own experience with God that we can hear the voice of God through the ears of our hearts. That we can sense God speaking to us if we really focus on setting aside all the junk that rushes through our minds and instead listen to the still quiet voice of God that speaks within us. The person whom I mentioned a moment ago who came to see me said to me, oh, okay, Bob, how the heck do I do that? How do I learn to listen to God? Help me out here. So I, I talked about a few strategies that, that I found worked for me over the years, and I sent him away with a book of devotional readings on the gospel narratives that I think will help him focus on listening in his quiet time. The, the reality is that this listening to God is something that we have to learn to do. It, it takes time. It's a process. It takes practice. 
And for me, one of the keys to learning to listen to God, it's to spend time with the Psalms. That's because I believe that in the Psalms, we, we find the whole range of human emotion. Any, any feeling that we could possibly have is there in that book of poetic prayers. From the mountain highs that speak to commitment and peace, to the lows of the valleys that can cause us to wonder if we're even going to be able to get through the day. One of the more spiritually insightful theologians in today's world is an Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. And I experienced his book entitled The Message of the Psalms as one of the more significant commentaries on the Psalms. Brueggemann groups the Psalms into three categories. He ties the movement from one category to the others with movements that exist within all of our lives. And his framework is one that I find myself going back to again and again to deepen my connectedness to God through the scriptures. First, Brueggemann talks about what he calls psalms of orientation that reflect those times in life when we feel truly connected with the God who is the source of all life, the wellspring of all strength and hope and joy. Times in which our experience of life is, is really punctuated by a sense of, of peace and tranquility, contentment and assurance. When we are confident about our direction in life and we know that God is present and active in the midst of our life experiences. Second, then, there are psalms that Brueggemann calls psalms of disorientation that reflect those times in our lives when things aren't going as we wish they were, when we experience loneliness, grief, fear, times in which our faith is called into question, times in which we may even doubt the loving nature of an ever-present God. A particular question posed by Jesus from the cross to me rings loud as the ultimate song of disorientation when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, God, is what Jesus is asking. Why have you left me alone? Why have you exited yourself from my life? A time of disorientation, even in the life of Jesus. Finally, Brueggemann talks about psalms of reorientation that reflect those, those times in our lives in, in which we begin to, to get it together again and to really feel that when after experiencing the turmoil of the storm, once again we begin to realize that the source of all that is good and loving and creative, that is God, is continually present in a process which is always leading us to hope and healing, to wholeness and peace. Psalm 91 fits into Brueggemann's third category, following on the heels of two other psalms that reflect the author's intense struggles in life. In fact, when you get home this afternoon, pull out your Bible and read Psalms 89 and 90, so you'll see what I mean. Following on them, Psalm 91 is a beautiful poem of faith that points to and embraces the goodness and mercy of God in the midst of the storm. You know, the danger of the message of Psalm 91 is that it, it may encourage what I would call a one-sided, shallow, immature view of what divine protection means. In too much popular piety, faith in God becomes little more than an insurance policy against trouble, and prayer becomes a form of magic, hocus pocus. Instead, faith must be understood within the larger context of the whole biblical narrative, which stresses that it's not that tough times in life don't occur. They do. I know they do. You know they do through our own experience of life, but in ways that go deeper than our understanding, God's purpose embraces and transforms 
all the ups and downs of life. And ultimately, as God writes in Romans chapter 8, God works everything together for those who love God. You know, I read a, a wonderful story some time back that was told by a young man at his father's funeral. He, he said it was the, the story of his earliest memory of his, of his father. It was spring in West, West Texas, tornado season. Jack was only maybe three or four years old at the time, and he, he said he remembers vividly the day that a tornado hit their small town. Jack's father hustled all the kids indoors, had them lie on the, the floor while he laid a mattress over them. But it, his father didn't climb under the mattress for protection. Jack remembers peering out from under the mattress and instead seeing his father standing with an eye looking out the open window, watching a funnel cloud twist and churn against the prairie. Jack reflects back and he said that when he saw his father, he knew where he wanted to be. He struggled to crawl out from under the mattress and he ran to wrap his arms around his daddy's leg. Something told me, Jack said, that the safest place to stand in a storm was next to my father. And I believe that. In the midst of life's toughest, most challenging times, I believe that. I believe it because over the years I've learned to listen to God. And God reminds me over and over again that God's promises never fade. God reminds me that nothing can separate us from God's love. That ultimately God will work all things together for good. And that is the psalmist sings in Psalm 91, God will deliver those who love God. God will protect those who know God's name. When we call to God, God will answer us. God will always be with us in trouble. God will rescue us and honor us. God will satisfy us with long life. And finally, God will show us God's salvation for all of this and for much more. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody staying safe. Don't forget, wear your mask. Let's stand as we finish up our time of worship this morning. It is hard sometimes to remember who we are, but God promises us that if we follow him, that we are his children. He has made us children of God.
that you are a child of God. Go in his grace and his peace and be blessed throughout this week. Amen.